Okay. Our speaker today is Dr. Jeff Tepper, Emeritus Geology Professor at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma. He got his PhD at UW and taught at UPS for 20 years before retiring in 2021. UPS's geology department is small and Jeff was their hard rock geologist. So he taught mineralogy, geochemistry and igneous and metamorphic petrology. And one of his research interests is the igneous and tectonic history of the Pacific Northwest, including the origins of the Chellis Volcanics. And I wouldn't mind having S and Jeff to come back someday and talk to us about that. I'm also an alumna of UPS, um, but it was I graduated before Jeff started teaching there, so I'm really dating myself here. However, I've talked with Jeff several times, both at GSA meetings and on an excellent Mount St. Helens trip he led quite a few years ago for UPS alumni. And I've been a bit jealous of later UPS students getting to learn geology from him. I've asked Jeff to give us a preview of the Adventure Geology Tours Costa Rica trip that he went on last spring uh, with a number of UPS students and that AWG will be offering as our 2024 field trip. So um, take it away, Jeff. Okay, thanks, Marcia. Um, and so this is, you know, we're a small group, so it's, I don't know if the technology permits this, but if along the way you have a question, um, it's okay with me if you just mic on and ask it. Uh, so as Marcia said, I taught at UPS for 20 years and Starting in 2008, we tried to run some kind of a non-credit field trip every other year. Um, we called them Journeys, G-E-O-R-N-E-Y-S. And the goal was to go someplace that was um, beyond where we could go in a class field trip. So um, we went to New Zealand, we went to Iceland, we went to, actually went to a lot of places that it sounds like AWG went. Um, and so the trip to Costa Rica, which was last May, was the most recent of those journeys. And um, in fact, in timing and almost everything else, it sounds like it's virtually identical to what you would be going on. So Marcia asked me if I would just share some of the details of what we did and how the trip went to um, hopefully inspire you to want to go as well. Um, part of the reason that we chose to go to Costa Rica was that um, we went with, I think, with Adventure Geology Travel, I think they call themselves. Anyway, the, the company that's run by Tammy Giovanelli and Joe Cook. So they're a husband and wife team. Uh, Tammy is a geology professor at a school in Georgia, and Joe is a nurse. And um, they did all the logistics for us, which was a major uh, burden lifted. I'm actually, I was not very involved because I'm emeritus, but I got to go because I was the volcano person. But um, Tammy and Joe handled all the, the logistics, the, um, the itinerary, the in-country transportation, the lodging. Um, so this talk is going to be mainly a travelogue, but I would just say that it was incredibly well organized. Um, everybody got at the beginning a guidebook. And I don't know if you can read the page on the right side there, but the guidebook basically had our, our itinerary for each day pretty much down to the hour. So you'd say, you know, between 6.30 and 7.30, you need to get up and have breakfast. And every place we stayed, the breakfast was you know, a buffet or a, a restaurant that was affiliated with where we were staying. So um, all the logistics were very smooth. All the lunches were already you know we would show up at a restaurant they were waiting for us so Marsha at one point said something to me that she thought because our trip was a student trip it might have been a more uh, regimented operation it was not I'll show you some places we stayed and I think it's probably the same places you're going to stay and it was by far the poshest geology expedition we've ever run on campus Um, and, and so um, that schedule, we stuck to that schedule really well. So they had, uh, Tammy and Joe had done enough you know, dry runs that what they thought was a reasonable schedule was, was attainable. So this is a map of Costa Rica. Um, 
which I'm sure you all know is in Central America, Nicaragua is to the north and Panama is to the south. It's small, it's about the same size as West Virginia. Um, and one thing I learned when I was on this trip is that Costa Rica has no military. And that, I guess in my mind, enables them to devote resources to more constructive aspects of running a country. So um, they're very focused on ecotourism. There's a lot of you know, um, ecotourism slash adventure tourism. So there's a lot of uh, opportunities for people to go there. In fact, you can see on this map all these uh, scuba diving places that you can go and there's a lot of adventure travel. And then the other thing that they're sort of focused on is what I would call a green economy. So Costa Rica grows a lot of, of coffee and they grow a lot of chocolate and they are um, adamant that no coffee that comes from Costa Rica is not organic. So they want that when you buy some Costa Rican coffee, they want you to know without even looking at the package, if it's from Costa Rica, it's organic. So this um, this emphasis on green and ecological marketing um, is one of the attributes of the country, I guess. Um, that's part of the reason I think that like a quarter of the country is set aside as nature preserves, some of which you would go to if you go on this trip, because it's an incredibly biodiverse place. I saw that 4% of all the species of, I guess, animals on earth are found within quarters of Costa Rica, because considering it's such a small place is quite a lot. So the trip is seven days. Um, can you see my cursor if I do this? Yes. Okay, so so we um, we didn't travel to San Jose as a group. Each person, each student was responsible for getting himself or herself to San Jose. But we rendezvoused at the airport, and then over the next seven days, we kind of made a loop, starting in San Jose and made a loop something like this, wound up back at the coast, and then came back to San Jose. And in route, then we're going to talk about three volcanoes that we visited, and then a couple of parks um, that are basically rainforests. So the first place we went is there were three, three volcanoes. They're all um, part of the, the Ring of Fire. They're all related to subduction around the rim of the Pacific. So the first volcano we went to was Poas. And we stayed at a, a lodge that was near there. And uh, we got there in late afternoon and it's um, it's an ecologically sort of focused lodge. So um, there's a, I, there's supposedly there's a game room. I didn't go to the game room. So I can't tell you like about games you can play, but it's a really nice place just to go for a walk. So I just took off on my own and walked around some of the roads that emanate from the the um, the main lodge there and there's all kinds of flowers and things you wouldn't see in you know in a normal wilderness setting in in North America and one of the things that uh, Tammy and Joe have coordinated is to have speakers who are researchers in Costa Rica give guest lectures in the evening so that first evening we had one of these lectures there were four total, Tammy gave one, and then there were three other speakers that she had coordinated with. And so the, uh, I think the first speaker talked about, talked about um, water chemistry issues. And so this was, uh, this was I think, a really um, beneficial part of the way they, they ran the program. And the only thing I would say, I guess, is that these people are not necessarily teachers, so they, I thought the presentation was fine. I think some of the students didn't know all of the background and they just should ask questions. So, you know, I, I think, well, I would hope that anybody who goes with AWG would be comfortable saying, you know, wait a second, can you explain this again? Because I think they all the speakers were happy to do that. They just didn't always know when somebody had a question. So the next morning, then we went to POAS, uh, which, is a, which is a park. 
and it's spectacular. So we were lucky with the weather, but it's an incredible uh, volcano. Uh, you can't really tell when you're there that it's a strato volcano, but it is. Um, but the the real um, draw at Poas is this lake in the crater. Um, so there, there are actually two lakes. One's uh, I don't have a picture of the other one. The other one's just a cold water lake. This one um, is called Laguna Caliente, and it's um, it's a pretty extreme place. Um, yeah. So the water temperature is like 40 C, which is 105 or something like Fahrenheit, but the pH ranges from minus one, which I didn't even know was possible, to about one. And so what's happening here is that sulfur, various sulfur gas, sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide are, are bubbling up from below and they're reacting with the water to make sulfuric acid. So it's an incredibly acidic environment. No swimming, I guess. No, no swimming, um, <laughs> no fishing, no boating. It's um, yeah. pictures only. Um, the viewpoint is great. So, sorry, my dog is jumping on me. Um, so you can you can look right down into the crater. The other thing that's I wanted to point out in this view is this spray painted yellow circle here and this concrete building. So the spray painted circle is where a, during an eruption, a volcanic block landed on the pavement. So there's a lot of, of these divots where um, you're close enough that during, they don't have um, igneous eruptions, but they have steam eruptions, which can fling rocks out. So part of the purpose for this concrete structure here is that if you happen to be there when that happened, you can take shelter inside of this, um, this building. <laughs> They are actively monitoring this in a variety of ways. So they occasionally have to close the park because of either gas levels or some concern about uh, the risk of an eruption. We had one of our speakers was um, a gas geochemist who gave a really interesting talk. And then the next morning um, showed his some of the equipment he uses. So they use a variety of, of sensors. Mostly they're measuring gas, although they also measure um, ground deformation and temperature and things like that. Um, they use drones. So like the technology they use is, is really cool. Um, so I felt compelled to stick one geochemical slide in, sorry. <laughs> But I just wanted to, I mean, I think Costa Rica is really kind of on the forefront in many ways of uh, volcano monitoring and eruption prediction. So in this figure, um, time is going across the top from 2013 to 2018. So it's about a five-year span of time. And any part of this graph that's shaded blue is a time when there was eruptive activity. This is at POAS. And what I wanted you to see is that they've, they've recognized a number of parameters that they can monitor that allow them to assess when an eruption is approaching. So in this topmost figure, um, this blue line is the temperature of that lake. And so just before the eruption, it went up. And this um, second, box here is the amount of sulfur dioxide that's coming out of the volcano in tons per day. And it went up, yeah. You see, just before it erupts, that goes way up. This is some kind of drone data. Um, they lose, apparently they lose a fair number of drones. They fly in here and then it erupts and that's the end. But uh, they're still getting a lot of useful information. This is a, a ratio of different gases. And again, it changes. So um, the bottom line is that they do sometimes have to close the park, but they're doing a, a you know, sort of cutting edge job of figuring out when they need to do that. From Poas, then we traveled to Arenal, which is the next volcano we went to. Mm -hmm. um, all the travel is by bus, uh, by, you know, by a chartered bus. Um, we don't travel, we don't travel very far, but Getting from place to place is kind of slow. So this is this is the highway. 
Um, it's paved, but it's just slow. But there's all kinds of you know flowering trees, and it's you know it's quite a beautiful uh, ride. So where we were going then was from Poas, which is this volcano, up here to Arenal, which is this one. So we stayed um, at a very nice resort uh, near uh, Arenal called the Los Lagos Resort. Um, it has a whole bunch of pools. Um, this is a pool with a swim up bar. There's water slides. So students had a really good time. It's also it was pretty easy to, we didn't have dinner provided while we were there, but it was really easy to take an Uber, for example, to go into La Fortuna, which is the, it's about, I think maybe four miles away. And that's a very uh, tourist oriented town. There's a lot of uh, ecotourism happening here. So I just went into town, had dinner one night. So from there, um, we went first to this reserve. Oops. Um, and the attraction here is these. Um, walkways that allow you to walk through the canopy. Um, so one of the things that we did before we went on the trip was have a, a lecture at UPS by a bi biology professor about rainforests. And if there's a way to do that, so it's my wife's trying to call. Um, it was really helpful to have some idea of sort of what to look for in a rainforest. And one of the things that I came away from that with is that the, the trees in a rainforest are just decorated, the trunks, the rims, with all kinds of... Um, Parasitic. Um, orchids, bromeliads, all kinds of, of epiphytes and things. So if there was a way to have some kind of pre-trip you know, exposure to like something, a little bit of background to rainforests, that wasn't something we got a lecture on while we were there, but it was really interesting. Yeah, so all these kinds of things growing on the, on the trunks. Um, there are animals, and I'm going to say in general, it's really hard to see them. So this is a bandicoot, which is sort of a raccoon-like creature. Uh, we had guides, and the guides are way more skilled than I was, anyway, at, at spotting things. Mm -hmm. But there's life at all scales, from um, monkeys and, and larger things down to all kinds of insects and little reptiles and amphibians, all kinds of colorful creatures. So one of the reasons obviously we went to the, the Arenal region was to go to Arenal Volcano. This is also a stratovolcano, but this one has the, the classic stratovolcano shape. Um, it is also in a park. And it was, um, it began erupting in 1968. So one of the things that we did was walk on the 1968 lava flow, which I guess not surprisingly after 52 years or whatever that is, um, is now pretty vegetated, um, but there's still, we could see the, we could look at the lava. Um, it's, it was erupting uh, fairly regularly from 1968 until 2010. And since then it has been dormant. Um, there is some steam that comes out. That steam is is just uh, meteoric water that's being heated and then coming back out as steam. One of the things that we also did while we were um, at Arenal was go to there's a waterfall there that, um, which you can hike down. And so we went swimming for one app part of one afternoon. And also while we were there, we went to a cave. Um, and this was actually one of the things I particularly liked. Um, and so I'm gonna give a disclaimer now that some of the things I'm gonna show you pictures of are totally optional. And I don't particularly, I don't at all actually like being in um, confined spaces, but this was okay. 
So they, you know, they provide you with helmets or hard hats and, and lights, and we have guides, and they took us in. Uh, we thought that students should think about why there was limestone in Costa Rica. So we actually had some impromptu lectures in the cave, talking about how, how caves form and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so there were parts like this on the left, which you, know, you had to crawl through water and some people opted not to do this. And so the, the guides said, you know, if you don't want to do this, you can just walk around the other way. So I opted to do this, um, but we had some other students, some actually some big guys who didn't really want to crawl through this relatively low spot. And then this is um, a place that's called the birth canal and you'll probably see why. So this is a little clip. And again, this is optional, but I liked it. I might watch a few more people. I'm gonna try again. So if you didn't want to do this, there was another way you could walk around. You didn't have to come back out this way. It's not clear. I know, come on down. This one? Is there a guide in there, Julian? Yeah. Oh, nice. Does it get smaller after this? For the rest of the way? I think it opens up after this squeeze. And I have to say, I would not have done this except that the guides had already gone through. So I knew it was doable and once it's it's actually quite a narrow little thing once you get through it it opens up i hope so sammy here that's what i'm we get out for the floor no so this is the smallest it gets. Oh, it sounds yeah. like it. Okay, can I come? Um, <laughs> okay, so um, one of the other things I liked about the trip was that you know, it was not 100% about geology. So we had one day where we went to a uh, plantation where they grow coffee, chocolate, and sugar cane. And so we had a, a guide who walked us through all the steps basically from growing the, the beans or the cacao to producing the final product. Uh, I don't drink coffee, so the coffee part wasn't as, well, I wasn't as informed about that, but the chocolate part was really amazing. So you start with a cacao fruit and then went through a couple of steps and then was basically looked to me like a like a sausage grinder. He put the, the beans in that, ground it into a paste, added some cinnamon and some, I think cayenne and, and I don't know what other spices. And then everybody got a spoon of this chocolate paste, which I have to say is probably the best chocolate I've ever had. Just amazing. And then at the end, there's a, a gift shop and a place where you can sample all kinds of different kinds of coffee and chocolate. So I, I, I thought that was quite well done and interesting. And then we got to uh, this point, we we're probably around day five and out of seven. And so we're now back on the Pacific coast at a national park called Manuel Antonio. And this is another place where the, the emphasis is on wildlife and um, so it's, it's another rainforest. This time we we're mostly on trails as opposed to uh, sky bridges. Uh, again, it's the it's hard to spot. I was thinking, though, know, I could take pictures of monkeys and things. That was hard. Um, so there's a monkey in the center here. This sloth was actually not at the park. It was at the hotel, and it was climbing on a pillar at the basically at, by the restaurant. Uh, but their guides are very good at 
spotting things and then they they have a spotting scope so they'll set it up and you can then look through it and, and see things um, so in the left here it's actually hard this is this is a picture taken through a spotting scope and it's hard to see to me that there's even an animal in here but what you're seeing is this gray at the end of it there's a dead limb here and at the end of it is some is an owl and this was a long way off um, through the through the trees. And I, to this day, don't know if it's just that that owl hangs out there every day or if somebody actually spotted it. But it was it was hard for me to see even through the spotting scope. But the guys are really good at spotting things and then setting up the scope and giving everybody a chance to, to take a look. Um, this was also in that park. This is um, leaf cutter ants which go up the tree trunk, harvest a little piece of leaf, and then bring it back down again to take it into their nest. So they're, it's just incredibly you know, different types of, of plants and animals than you would see uh, any place in the US. Uh, this park is on the coast. So the, um, part of the day, the end of the walk through the rainforest, um, we came out to a beach. And so we had a couple hours to sort of hang out at the beach before lunch. So some students went, well, some people went swimming. Um, and then there's a, this was not actually part of the itinerary, but there's a nice like subduction melange outcrop down here at the end of the beach. So you come on the beach down here when, so I just walked down here and I saw this. So it was a nice additional part of the overall geologic story to go with the volcanoes. And then the third volcano we went to was Irasu. So we were at this point had driven back closer to San Jose. And Irasu is another stratovolcano. Um, we hike up to the, to the rim. The, well, the weather was not as clear this day, so I don't have a lot of pictures of it, but it was another opportunity to, to be on a stratovolcano and um, look into the crater. So from there, we went back to San Jose. Um, and then different, uh, stayed in a hotel fairly close to the airport. So it was easy to take a shuttle um, the next morning to the, air, uh, to the airport and to go home. Some students went early. I, I didn't, but some students went early and, and sort of extended their vacation. And that seemed to go well. So um, that was it. I'm happy to answer questions. I, I think it was incredibly well organized and definitely not a rough it kind of experience and uh yeah so i'm happy to answer questions beth is that a um so uh how was the weather it looks like it was pretty hot it was it um it, it was well it varied so it, it was a significant elevation difference between say being at poas or arenal versus being at manuel antonio which is right on the beach so it was pretty warm and humid when you're at, you know down at sea level. We be we were there almost I think exactly the same time of year as you'd be there. So it was right after graduation, which was like May fifteenth or something. So we were. And uh, how much hiking was there? Um, not a lot. So. Um, at both of the nature preserves, there's a walk. Um, and one of them was on these, um, partially on, on sky bridges, uh, but basically no, no vertical gain. So you're basically on trails. And the only real hike I would say we did was at Arenal, we went out to lava flow. And so that required, um, there's some steps you go up to get up the side of the flow onto the top and I don't remember exactly how much that was, but it was maybe it was maybe a hundred feet vertical, something like that. And then there was a trail. Um, but a lot of places we went, it was a walk. It wasn't really a hike. So at, at um, Poas and at Irasu, you have to walk from the parking lot to the the rim of the crater. Um, it's on a, a you know, 
basically on a road, although it's close to, close to, to tourist traffic. And I can't remember the exact distance, but I would say we didn't walk more than half an hour in any of those cases to get from the car to the viewpoint. Um, what was the lava flow like? Was it uh, basaltic, or, or, which is what I think of, a, or it must have been more silica rich if it's from a stratocone. Right, it was a porphyritic andesite. So, okay. So that was one of the, it was porphyritic, so okay. So, so one of the, you know, I guess. What, what does it look like on the surface? Does it look like a, a flow or something? No, it's very rubbly, um, and that's, yeah. it's it's somewhat vegetated because it's been fifty years since it erupted. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I use that. You know, I, I, my idea of a field trip is probably different with students than maybe other people. So I I don't. I'm not as inclined to have like show and tell as I am. You look at this and then we'll talk about it. So that was a good opportunity for us, you know, with students to say, okay, what's this white mineral? And then think about, um, we talked about how when there's a lot of crystals, then it's a very viscous magma. It doesn't go very far. So how you could you know, if all you had was the hand sample and you didn't have any, you didn't know where it came from, you could still work out, well, this is probably from a subduction zone and this lava flow was viscous and it was probably a stratovolcano, blah, blah, blah. So okay. um, we had some, sorry, we had a couple of local guides. They know more about the human history than they do about the geologic history. Um, mm -hmm. So there was there was a couple of villages that were overrun by lava flows in 1968, and there was some loss of life associated with that. So they you know, shared some of that information, but they really weren't. Um, well, I left them a page of notes about phenocrysts <laughs> and things, so that they wanted. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, you know, they seemed interested. I don't know. We'll see how. But okay. Uh, it, 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 I got yeah. it. I, that was like the GSA field trip I went on. I ended up being kind of the quasi leader because I knew about the basalt. Uh, yeah. So I think. <laughs> oh, are you, know, you? I mean, I got to go because I was the igneous petrologist at UPS, and so that's where I got to earn my ticket. I guess was yeah. guiding students through, because there actually are some really interesting outcrops. Um, at Irazu as well, which that was not really what uh, that's you know Tammy was would get you there, but she doesn't lecture very much once you get there. So, um, you know, I think in a group of geologists, you'd have people who would say, "Oh, look at this! That's what we did," and so sort of yeah. add yeah. to what they had. Two questions um, yeah. regarding the walks that Beth or exercise or hikes. Is there time and locations where you can go off for a walk i don't mean a wilderness hike or anything but is there time for other exercise during the day um and then my second question has to do with although you don't i don't think you did it um if does it make any sense to stay a couple days before and after or just a couple days before um are there you know guided trips and tourist things that you can hook into if if I wanted to extend this day. Do you have any information on that? Okay, so several students did that and I don't think they signed up for uh, guided tours. I think most of them went to the coast, but we didn't really, we went to Manuel Antonio, which was this you know, park on the coast, but we didn't really do the surfing stuff. Um, so I think the short answer to your question is, if I had had more time, I would have gone, probably gone early. And I, we saw nothing of San Jose, for example. So, okay. uh, and we saw I'm... nothing of the Caribbean coast. So I think there are a lot of places that, that would be interesting to visit. I probably wouldn't go to more volcanoes because we went to three. Okay. Don't know yeah. that I would go. There are other ones, including some that are much more active than, uh, the ones we went to. Uh, what was the other question? Was about, about hiking um, time and 
geography of your days? So the day is very structured and it would be hard to, unless you were, well, it'd be hard to find a way to do that after you left in the morning and before you got back in the evening. Okay. However, the evenings were, were you know, we, we would just generally get back, you know, early enough that there was time before dinner. And so, for example, at Poas, where we stayed in that lodge, I, I went for a hike. And it was just, you know, on roads that, and or fields, you can go through fields. Um, and there's all kinds of trails, because that's really what that um, eco lodge is all about, is people going there to hike. So that place definitely... And um, the same at um, La Fortuna. I don't. I can't tell you exactly where to go, but I think a lot of people go there and hike, and okay. don't necessarily um, have to go to Arenal to do that. So I think I'm pretty sure that if you <clears throat> did a, you know, a Google search for, you know, hiking near La Fortuna or hiking near um, Manuel Antonio, you'd find information about trails and things like that. It would just have to be <clears throat> probably in the early evening or get up like <clears throat> the other faculty member who went with me, I think she got up and went for a run every morning. So if you're, you know, if you want to get up, we didn't start up courageously early in the morning. So if you, you know, went to get up at 6.30, you'd have an hour and a half probably before you had to be um, ready to go. Okay, thank you. I have a question about the rocks. <laughs> okay. I like that. okay. Well, um, just I'm interested. I'm I was intrigued by the fact that there's actually karst topography there. That there's limestone caves. Um, you know, when you first said caves, I was thinking, oh, lava tube. It would have to be a lava tube, but there is. So what? Uh, what? Well, I know what limestone means. It means you had a warm, shallow tropical sea, which you still have there. But can you uh, shed any light on what the origin of the limestone is? Yeah. So um, at a first pass, the geology of Costa Rica is seems simple. OK, so it's, it's part of the ring of fire. There's a chain of volcanoes that's related to subduction. But when you start looking in more detail, it's actually fairly complicated because the subducting plate is um, different in different places and they're subducting a spreading ridge. But the, um, one of the consequences of subduction is that the land has been uplifted. Mm, okay. That limestone, yeah. that was part of what we wanted the students to think about in the cave was why is there limestone here? And so we- yeah sort of gave them two options. One is that this is uplifted land that's um, uplifted as a result of the convergence. Or yeah. is this kind of, you know. Uh, and you got that drop in the water table to make a cave, you know. Yep. Um, so in this case, um, it's related to uplift of the whole sort of isthmus there as a consequence of subduction. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So, it, you know, because it's a, a you know a tropical place, outcrops are kind of few and far between. So there wasn't a lot of like, stop the van, jump out on the side of the road kind of things because there's yeah. not a lot to see. There's not, yeah, yeah. So they, you know, they've scouted out places where there are exposures that are worth your time. And the only one that I, would have added was this melange on the beach. But. Yeah. Good. One of the nice things, I, I hate to say this, but one of the nice things about the, the fires that we've had recently, and there's nothing nice about it, but it does expose a lot more rocks. I've been to several places where I was going to on a regular basis, and then once you know, the fire strips away the vegetation. Wow, you can really, you know, you really see the rocks. The other thing in Costa Rica is that because it's hot and tropical, the weathering rates are really high. So yeah, if you're kind of partial to fresh rock outcrops. You're going to have a hard time finding it, yeah. 
accompanied by some yeah not so fresh rock interesting and how long was the tour how many days was it seven days not including the day we departed okay so seven days and seven nights and during that time <laughs> we stayed in um four different places so we had two places where we stayed two nights and three places where we spent just one night mm -hmm. i've got a question about um poas volcano okay can um when you showed the caliente lake right it didn't it looked like there was a, a higher peak behind it It was, uh, you know, it was kind of shrouded in the clouds. Right. And so it didn't look like it was a summit lake. Well, um, yeah, see, see. It's, it's, this is nested in a, this is nested in a bigger caldera. So I, I, there's probably been multiple episodes of, you know, eruption and, and collapse. So I, and that's why I said it's it's hard to appreciate that this is a stratovolcano because you're too you're too close. So this uh, Laguna Caliente and the other lake, which is again it's a cold water lake, are both sitting inside of this larger crater area. Okay. Okay. So this, so this in the background there, I th you know, is part of the mountain, but it's an older part of the mountain, and this is nested within that. And it looks looks like the, uh, there's another lake to the south of it. There's another crater in a lake. I'm looking on a map. To the south. Um, well, what, the, I don't know if one of them is this other lake, which is the Coldwater Lake. But it's within, you know, we, we walked from this lake on a trail that went over to the other lake. So there are, there are two lakes very close together side by side and you know one of the things that tammy wanted to emphasize was that their plumbing is totally different even though mm -hmm. they are in close proximity one of them is you know one of the most acidic places on earth and the other you know it, i don't think you can go to it because it's just I, I think it's in the park and you know they don't want tourists in there but you could swim in it i mean it's a very appealing looking cold water lake so it's yeah I'm seeing it. it's called Laguna Botos. Yeah, that's the that's it. I think that's so. Both of those are inside of the larger crater. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Hmm. So can you can you go back to the map of Costa Rica and point to where each of the volcanoes? Yeah. So so here's again here's San Jose. This is Poas, this is Arenal, and this is Irasu. Mm -hmm. So we kind of made a, a trip driving up here first, looping around. Um, Manuel Antonio is down here. So we came up, looped around like this, and then went to Arenal, or, yeah, uh, Irasu mm -hmm. before ending the day here. Yeah. I'm not seeing any of this. All I see is. Oh, one of the participants' names on the screen. Um, oh, the, I'm, the, seeing, the I'm seeing it. Up at the top of the participants' name, are there four little things you can click on, one of which will change the size of the uh, audience box? Yeah, there should be a box that says view, and you can change it to different views. Does anyone else have any questions for Jeff? Well, I enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. I'm going to stop recording. Thank you.